Ray Wax. He has been a stockbroker on Wall Street for several years. He lives in an upper middle class suburb on the outskirts of New York City. He is married, has two grown children. I really believed when I was growing up that somehow I would score. As a kid, I was no more than 12. I'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go to an open market where they sold cakes in an open stall. It was so goddamn cold you had to cut the goddamn cakes with mittens. I made 4 or 5 dollars a day. That was a lot of money in those days. I worked. I felt good about it. I was a golf caddy at 14. I used to carry two sets of golf bags for 18 holes for $2.50. I guess it's a $10 bill today. You really earned your pay when you went through 18 holes. If the caddy master liked you, maybe you did 36 holes. I felt even though there was money in the house, I was supposed to work. I was supposed to earn something. It was one of the things you had to do. If you did, it was supposed to make you feel good. I was a good caddy, and I felt good about that. I felt that somewhere along the line, someone would recognize that I had that special gleam, Horatio Alger, which is a crock of shit. For 20 years, he engaged in all sorts of enterprises, and I was generally successful. Then I lost interest, or I thought the promise had gone out of it, and I went on to something else. In the late 50s, I had exported cars to South America. I was doing a million dollars a year, and sort of ran out of steam. My one virtue was I didn't rip anybody off. For a while I thought I could live in South America. And I found out that the whole world was rigged. They didn't want me to do anything legit. What kept you from becoming a millionaire? I just wasn't... I wasn't facile enough. I was bright enough to do the things I had to do to make a good living, but I really didn't come up with the big score. And... Well... There was a limit to what I was prepared to do to make money in a crazy way. But that's no good. You're supposed to do everything you have to do to make money. I guess at some point there's a limit. You either demean yourself or change yourself or something happens where you become something else. Later, when I owned a hotel, the only way I could survive is if I let a pimp put four broads in the bar. I passed. I couldn't do it. I eventually lost the hotel. He became a land speculator. I kind of ran out of money, because land takes a lot of money. I became a real estate broker in self-defense. I began to peddle land. I sold land to builders. I realized they were just one cut above running a candy store. Within a couple of years, I was building houses and building them better than anybody's ever built them before. I really had some kind of responsibility to build a house that was a good house. Until I began to run out of land. I loved building houses. It's really a marvelous thing. You work with people that work with their hands. When the carpenters come in to work, God damn it, they're good. When the bricklayers come in, they gotta know their job. I had a roofer, a Norwegian or whatever the hell he was, and he went up on that roof and he bucked that stuff there. Man, you knew you were gonna have the best roof you ever had on a house. I didn't cheat on the house. I sold my own houses, wouldn't turn them over to an agent. I enjoyed doing that more than anything I ever enjoyed in my life. I don't know why I didn't continue it. I was kind of driven. I had to go on to do something else. I couldn't see myself building a development of 50, 100 little boxes. I couldn't get the kind of plots where I could put 5, 6 houses on 1 or 2 acres to build a house with enough nuances. The challenge went out of it after a while. I invested in a hotel. It had 101 keys. I got fascinated with hotels, the operation of it, how it was put together, who came, who went. I came out with a quarter of a million and I built my own hotel, alongside the World's Fair of Grounds. We did the biggest job of any motel at the fair. In two years, the fair was a shambles. 
The area was a desert. Death. I walked away with a whole skin, but gave the hotel back to the bank. While I was fiddling around with the hotel, I began to play the market. I got lucky at some point and made about $100,000. That convinced me I could make this my way of life. I thought it'd be a nice way to live. I began to study to be a stockbroker. I passed the exam. You'll learn the ethical side of the business, what you can and cannot do. It's all mumbo jumbo. The New York Stock Exchange has 1,066 members. I always think of it as the Norman Invasion. These are William the Conquerors. The 1066 is one of the greatest clubs in the world. A seat on the exchange costs anywhere from $100,000 in bad times to a half a million in good times. These guys didn't pay that price of admission without deciding that they're going to take care of each other, protect their own. They're the guardians of all that stock. They're the specialists. They dole out these stocks to each other and they have the edge. They become the bookies on all the stocks. This is the only wheel in town. I really thought of the market as a sort of river, money running to the sea. I figured all I had to do was just stand on that bank and lower a bucket every once in a while and take a little bit of that out. I didn't care how much these gentle gentiles with these little briefcases under their arms took back to Larchmont or how much went up to Westport. I figured they're gonna let me lower my bucket, but they don't let anybody lower a bucket. I'm afraid the work of a stockbroker is superfluous. He did have a function at one time when little people were allowed in the market and given a chance to share in part of the goodies. The market really is a game played by very skilled people who accumulate stocks at low levels so they can be distributed at high. The market is rigged. Knowledgeable people buy certain stocks, whether they have intrinsic value or not, and at some later hour, the public is told these stocks represent good values and should be purchased. By the time Joe Blow comes in, the people who've created this atmosphere go out. For every dollar made in the market, a dollar has been lost. The pros make it. The 1066 boys. The brokerage firms need some people to make this whole machine work. Somewhere in this pattern of things is the stockbroker. Here's where I come in. We're all hooked in. I'm watching every transaction. Everything that happens in the market, I see instantaneously. I have a machine in front of me that records and memorizes every transaction that takes place in the entire day. It's called a Bunker Ramo. It's really a television screen that reproduces the information from a master computer that sits in New Jersey. Within a fraction of a second, when I press for the symbol I want, it goes to the central computer and it automatically comes back. When I take my hand from the machine, the screen in front of me is already reproducing the information. I watch 18 million, 20 million shares pass the tape. I look at every symbol, every transaction. I would go out of my mind, but my eye has been conditioned to screen maybe 200 stocks and ignore the others. I pick up with my eyes Goodrich, but I don't see ITT. I don't follow international tell, I'm not interested in that. I don't see IGT, but I do see IBM. There are over 3,200 symbols. I drop the other 3,000. Otherwise, I'd go mad. I really put in an enormously exhausting day. It's up at 6.30. I read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal before 8. I read the Dow Jones ticker tape between 8 and 10. At 3.30, when the market closes, I work until 4.30 or 5.00. I put in a great deal of technical work. I listen to news reports avidly. I try to determine what's happening. I'm totally immersed in what I'm doing. For the amount of work and intelligence I bring to this job, I'm not being properly compensated. I make a routine living now. The only compensation is like me against the machine. I'm trying to use my intelligence against the wheel. I'm a fucking John Henry fighting this goddamn steel drill, and I'll probably die with my hammer in my hands. <laughs> uh, because I don't want to buy the package. Maybe I'm wrong, but I want to get there my way. It's very difficult. That's God's truth. 
the market moves to destroy you. Play it your way, sucker. Buy the package. Believe in the American dream. Buy the hundred time multiple. Believe in IBM. And if you doubt it, God help you. Don't ever question what you're doing. People go to the racetrack. When there's 50,000 people at the track, 49,990 are there to lose money. It's kind of a self-flagellation. There's maybe 10 people in that park who are pros, who've been there at six in the morning and clocked the horses, who felt the turf and talked to the jockey or stable boy. They're the professional gamblers. They're there for just one reason, to make money. The 49,990 other slobs, they're there to lose. I don't have to tell you about the horses. People who go into the market are committed to losing money. They don't blame the broker. They don't blame the machine, which is rigged against them. The moment you buy a stock, you're hooked. You're going to pay a commission on the way in or on the way out. Normally, that's a sizable percentage. The stock has to move up at least a point and a quarter for you to get even. If you bought a stock at 50, it has to move to 51.35 before you'd get even. You're being humped before you even get around the corner. The moment you buy that stock, you're a loser. What I try to do to justify my existence is to understand how it works. I took courses, I took in every lecture, I subscribe to services, I do charting. I'm almost like that gambler who clocks the horse at 6 in the morning on the workout when they blow that horse out. But I'm really on the outside looking in. Somebody else has rigged the race and knows who's going to win it. And somebody else knows what stock's going to go. I'm sure every stock has a group that decides when they're going to go and when they're going to get off. All you can hope to do when you see that train moving. There's the theory of the moving train. When the train begins to move. All you can do is see it move and hope to get on. You don't know when the train slows down until after the big boys have jumped off. You're going to get on 10 points after they did and get off 10 points after they did. If you can discern the direction of the train. Maybe if I was 20, 25 years and I just came out of Harvard and I believed this bullshit, which is packaged and wrapped, Wall Street, Madison Avenue. The people even look the same. They really believe in their invulnerability. They believe their own success story. I don't believe it. That's a hell of an argument to be a broker. In a crazy way, I do a service. I try to give such customers as I have a rational explanation for an investment. I try. Look. We've got 80 billions of dollars worth of money floating around in Europe. It's non-convertible. We've fucked every country in the world. We've got every central bank in the world with dollars up to their ass. They can't do anything with it. We said to him, we're the Texans. The world belongs to Connolly. He told them in effect, live with that money. We've bought your companies. We've taken over your economies. We've given you dollars that are spurious. Don't blow the whistle on us, because the whole fucking sky is going to come down, Chicken Little. Maybe two, three years from now, if the spirit moves us, we may talk about the convertibility of the dollars into gold. In the meantime, fuck ya. Yeah. Put those dollars in our treasury notes, buy our stocks, do something with them. But don't come back to me to redeem them, because they're worthless. We fucked the world. I've seen them do this. I buy gold. I buy silver. It's the only thing that's real. You can't buy gold in this country. We don't dare. If we let Americans buy gold, everybody be digging up his fucking backyard and burying gold bullion in it. Because he knows the fucking thing's real. I try to perform a function that has some meaning. I try to take somebody's money and not make shit out of it. If a banker's taking your money and giving you 5% and he's earning 12% on it, there should be a better way for the little man to participate. He should do 
a hell of a sight better than giving it to an insurance company or a bank. It shouldn't be that rigged. He should have a chance to get a fair return on that money. He's worked for it. Somebody else shouldn't be able to use that money and get a 12% return while paying the little guy five in front. The real money made in the market is being made by people with real wealth. I'll say, if you give me $5,000, I can make you a 10% return. If we're pretty good, maybe I can get you 20%. If it's a smash, maybe we'll double it. But the only way you're going to make a million dollars is to start with a million dollars. People who have made money in the market have consistently had money. The great wealth in this country has bought Johnson & Johnson, has bought IBM. They never sold a share. To this day, 66% of the stock is owned by people that never sold a share. They bought General Motors in 1930. They never sold it. They didn't put it in the banks at 4% return. They live on the return. They never sell the principal. I'm trying to use my intelligence, which I've exercised in other businesses, but it's like wrestling with an octopus. Too many things that I can't control are happening. I can tell you what happened after the fact, but it's difficult to tell you before the fact. The market never really repeats itself exactly in the same way every day. There is similarity over the years. Jesse Livermore, a legend, went broke three times. But he was so valuable to the street, he created so much excitement that the fraternity, the 1066 Club, gave him the money to put him back in business. His manipulation in the market, his activity, created additional sales every day. Other people became excited and involved. Yet this man, with all his experience, continually got wiped out. He was bucking something bigger than he was. Ultimately, he was destroyed and killed himself. He lost touch with even the reality he knew. Note. Arthur Robertson recollects. Livermore said, I own what I believe to be the controlling stock of IBM and Philip Morris. So I asked him, why do you bother with anything else? He answered, I only understand stock. I can't bother with businesses. So I asked him, do men of your kind put away $10 million where nobody can ever touch it? He looked at me and answered, Young man, what's the use of having $10 million if you can't have big money? End note. It's really an illusion. It's only real because enough people believe it's real. The whole market is based on a premise. Potential growth. You can put any kind of multiple on a stock. If a stock earns a dollar a year, it sells for a hundred. It's selling at a hundred times its earning capacity. If you believe the stock is a reflection of some future experience that you can invest in a hundred times its earning capacity and that you will subsequently benefit, you qualify as a true believer. But the moment you question that premise, the whole thing collapses like a house of cards. You have to buy this whole crazy fiction, or there would be no market. IBM, Eastman Kodak, Xerox, these are called growth stocks. And they're held by every major institution, every pension fund, every university. This is the backbone. Nobody questions the basic premise that these stocks will continually get better. Polaroid, over the past four years, has had an earning growth of minus 11. But because they've got a camera that is unique, they pretend they will expand at an infinite rate. As long as you believe that, you can pay 130 for Polaroid, as it was today. You'll pay anything, as long as you believe this American dream that growth is forever. But the people who make this market, at some bad hour, they're gonna sell Polaroid at 130 to schnooks like you and me. And they're gonna pick it up again at 65 and start the whole process all over. They've done it continually. 
Some people know me over a period of years and have allowed me to handle their business. I've created new businesses on solicitation depending on how good my track record is. The function of a broker is to try to get his account to trade. The real money is never made by selling stock. A broker's lifeblood, the only money he makes, is by generating commissions. Most money is made by people in getting to people to turn their portfolios, their stocks, over three, four, five times a year. If you're really unethical, cynical, the milder word, you may get them to turn their stocks over 10 times a year or 15 times. There's a name for it. Brokers merely are ribbon clerks. They're order takers. They do very little if it's a big house. It's a profession that's in its decline. Everything is being committed to computer, to systemized tapes. These are houses on now on the street that say, don't you ever make a decision. We have a computer that tells you what to do to your customer, to buy or to sell. At some point, the function of a broker may be relegated to some girl who sits at a phone and repeats what the computer has told the customer to buy and to sell. I see Wall Street being reduced to kind of supermarket. The biggest houses will be swallowing the others. You'll wind up with four or five houses and not many more than half a dozen. There are houses that guarantee if you utilize the machine, you'll get five or ten trades a year out of your customers. They'll put them in a stock and they'll take them out. Beautiful. But in actual practice, when the market goes sour, the machine breaks down. It can't take care of the vagaries. The machine can't account for an economic crisis or a world depression. The machine can't account for an unemployment rate that exceeds 6%. The machine can't account for a military adventure in Vietnam. It's a robot. It can do what the program tape tells it to, but it can't account for the extraordinary world we live in. People like me start out with a feeling that there's a place for them in society, that they really have a useful function. They see it destroyed by the cynicism of the market. A piece of worthless stock can be given glamour and many people may be induced by it. Excitement, public relations. The people can be wiped out with the absolute cynicism that brings those who conceived it to the top. Can you imagine? I really felt I could buck this machine. When I began, I was sure I could win. I no longer have that confidence. What's happening is so extraordinary. It's so much bigger than I am. I'm just trying to go along for the ride. I have little to do with it. They believe the game because they know how the cards are gonna be dealt. I don't believe the game because I know the cards are stacked. After being told about fiscal responsibility, they know the treasury is going to spew out all kinds of dollars and all kinds of money is going to be made available to the corporations for them to put in the market. This is a contradiction. This is where the thing breaks down. I can't say what I'm doing has any value. This doesn't make me too happy. If I could learn in some way to live with the wheel, but I can't. If I make an error and it costs the customer money, it's as though it were my money. This is extraordinary. The average broker lives to generate commissions and he goes home as though he were selling ties or shoelaces. He doesn't carry the goddamn market with him. I carry it like it was a monkey on my back. Man, I wake up in the middle of the night remembering what I did right or wrong. That's no good. But I really can't make it happen. When I built the houses, I hired a bricklayer. I hired the roofer. I determined who put the goddamn thing together. And when I handed somebody a key, the house was whole. I made it happen. I can't do it in the market. I'm just being manipulated and moved around, and I keep pretending I can understand it, that I somehow can cope with it. The truth is, I can't. The broker, as a human being, is being demeaned by the financial community. His commissions are being cut. 
I joined the Association of Investment Brokers. We number about a thousand members as against 40,000 brokers, which tries to think of itself as though it were the pilot's union. The terrible thing is we don't fly planes. We handle the fucking phone and punch out digits, digits on something that translates from a computer. We pretend we have status in the community, but we're expendable. The brokerage firms just cut our commission again while they increased their own rate by 42%. The SEC approved a new set of commission rates. The SEC is just an arm of the stock exchange. They put their people in it. Like every regulatory agency, it serves the exchange and pisses on the public. The commissions for the houses are larger, but I make no more than I made before. This happened in every firm on the street. It's as though they went out and played golf together and agreed on it. In this ripoff, we're treated with contempt by the members of the stock exchange. You're being told you're not a useful member of society. They're really saying, if you make too big a noise, we're going to have a girl take the orders and the machine will do the rest. You're better off to let us make your decisions. Don't attempt to use your intelligence. Don't attempt to figure out what's happening if you know what's good for you. Oh, I'll continue to cope. <laughs> I'll continue to struggle with the machine. I'll continue with my personal disillusionment. <laughs> oh, I'd like to wake up one morning and go to some work that gave me joy. If I could build houses all over again, I would do it. But when it's finished, somebody's gonna live in it. And the house is gonna be built. And it's gonna be there after I'm gone. Oh, fuck it. <laughs>